very warm welcome everybody in this webinar with Elets Techno Media. I am Karthik Sharma, Associate Editor with Elets Techno Media Group. And uh, we are very honored and we are very glad that on this very uh, special and uh, insightful discussion uh, uh, for next one hour, we have eminent dignitaries from various parts of the country and various eminent institutions of the country here with us. And uh, the discussion topic will be redefining the leadership in virtual environment, innovation to transformation. So before uh, moving on to the discussion, I just introduce all of you about ELETS Technomedia and its initiative of ELETS webinars. ELETS Technomedia, as most of you know that we are from last 17 years, we are working towards promoting <coughs> innovations and connecting the innovators, the people who are working on grounds for promoting innovations. And today when the world is experiencing social distancing, ELETS is still connecting people through the online medium. And uh, this is this initiative is ELETS webinar. And today, uh, yesterday only we crossed 100 webinars uh, in this uh, pandemic uh, COVID-19 crisis uh, period. So uh, continuing with it, we have leaders, eminent leaders from eminent institutions with us. I'll introduce all of them to the audience and um, we'll welcome them. I'll start with the uh, Professor Bharat Bhaskar, Director of Indian Institute of Management. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you. I welcome uh, uh, Ms. Silky Jain, Executive Director of Tulas Institute. Welcome, Silky Jain. Dr. Rahul Dasgupta, Trustee and Director of Globesin Business School. Hi, everybody. Hi. Professor Christopher Abram, CEO of Dubai Campus SP Jain College of Management. Namaskar, everyone. Welcome, Professor. <laughs> Mr. Abhay Gupta, founder and CEO of Luxury Connect Business School. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Dr. Akhil Sahani, Managing Director of the Sahani Group. I do all the attendees and the uh, panelists, and it's great to be here. Professor Rao Bhamidamari, uh, President of Institute of Advanced Research, a veteran leader in this ecosystem. And um, so this eminent panel we have today for this discussion, uh, having, we are having this on the ages of digital learning magazine, working from last 17 years towards promoting innovations in the field of education, especially the digital learning space. And um, uh, I welcome all of you and as you all know that today uh, this uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis has uh, brought a paradigm shift in um, almost all the sectors. There are new challenges and some people are seeing new opportunities also. So, but there is some uncertainty, there is some need of changing the plans, need some, uh, there are various needs like that. So I will just request uh, all of you to please introduce yourself to please introduce your institutions and share your views in brief on this pandemic and uh, the impact of it on the ecosystem. And I will start with uh, Professor Bharat Bhaskar, Director of IIM, Raipur, uh, if I'm right, uh, Indian Institute of Management, Raipur. Professor Bhaskar, please. Thank you, Karthik. Uh, actually, in a very dynamic uh, time that we are living in, you have uh, rightly pointed out and uh, talked about the environment, what is going around us. The fact remains that this is an event, although a threat to humanity, but bigger, bigger than that, it's also a transformation event. It's an accelerating event because something which was happening in your magazine has been always at the forefront of that digital push. So digital transformation was a need of our education was actually going through transformation in past two to three years in a quite a big force. It was only building the momentum. It would have happened in what would have happened in five next five to seven years, probably will happen in next two years or even in six to eight months now, because the necessity is, is dictating that we may accelerate all that what is going to happen. We will survive this event like we have survived in the past World War II, we have survived 9-11, we have survived the Spanish flu, 
but all those events have changed the attitudinal behavior of human kind and this event is if you have seen can we imagine that we can live in a house for 40 days and yet carry out the work and the work is carrying getting carried on we are transforming ourselves we are changing people who are never online could never think of an online class or interacting in this kind of environment they are all interacting today so fundamentally education sector which was building the digital platform already getting into that uh, environment is now assessing their infrastructure for example i am from iim raipur we have built a modern digital infrastructure we were already testing it for one and a half years by running multiple programs which were actually online at distributed delhi mode now of course we are a flagship program which is our mba program of iims that was our uh, bread and butter and we call it a flagship that was a residential program how that program will be transformed we'll talk about as we proceed further uh, beyond the introduction uh, introductory phase but our those dynamic environment uh, which is reflected in front of us has given us an opportunity to now reach out and democratize the education probably our flagship program will remain flagship program after couple of years or year year and a half down the line i can't say i am a great believer of a classroom and interactive uh, human to human learning that will not go away but that will that also had a problem that iims together and all these top management schools schools together could not produce enough manpower there is always a push to increase the strength and infrastructure dictated we could not increase the strength today that democratization is happening we are as we are i said we are trying it and all other ims are also trying it and now probably rather than taking and teaching those 400 students as a intake every year we are even thinking of teaching 4000 students but yes we may call those programs in a differential mode the many of the responsibilities i am takes about their program may not be same but it's better to have that management education than having no access to the management education uh, that is the going that is going to be the long term positive impact or acceleration caused by this corona event which is happening around us thank you but you rightly said uh, professor baskar i think they're saying that uh, sometimes a week happens in decades and sometimes decades happen in a week sure. and uh, we are experiencing it and you and i am speci especially is uh, in the uh, for indian youth it is in its plans uh, like they have iit iim is so i think uh, uh, a lot uh, would be uh, interested uh, we will be interested to uh, know about your uh, change of plan of iims definitely uh, but again uh, uh, because we have other business institutes also also with us and uh, i will request um, all of you to also uh, just explain uh, more about your institute also so that uh, our attendees will also get to know more about institute and their questions will be specifically to the each institute so i'll uh, request uh, silky to uh, miss silky executive director of kulas institute to please introduce yourself institute and then your uh, about your views of the uh, thank you, Karthik, and good evening to all the panelists. I think it's a great evening, and thank you, Eilids, for giving us this platform. So, uh, yeah, I'm Silky Jain Marwa from Tulas Institute, and we also have a boarding school in the name of Tulas International School. And both the institutions are based out of a beautiful city uh, called as Dehradun. So, talking about uh, college in specific today, so we have a strength of 4,000 students, and uh, which are in under various undergraduate and postgraduate uh, courses. And uh, Tulas Institute basically came into existence almost 14 years back in 2006 uh, under uh, exactly by my father, uh, the chairman, Mr. Sunil Kumar Jain. And uh, talking about uh, right now, this situation of COVID-19, I think it's the first time ever that uh, institutions were asked to shut down without any summer break or winter break or even for a semester break. So uh, we had a great, uh, uh, we had a lot of challenge uh, when this uh, COVID-19 situation was asked and asked us to lock down and vacate our complete the colleges. The first step we did was we had to vacate our hostels completely because we had no idea that uh, when is this COVID-19 situation is going to come to an end. Uh, we also arranged for the transports for the students to go back uh, to their cities safely uh, because we had to plan that as well. 
uh, then moving on, of course, education has to move on. Uh, and I think uh, uh, our, the colleges like us who are not prepared for this online delivery, for the very first time, we started our faculties uh, to take the physical classes. Uh, and uh, uh, from basically, we started to resume these online classes from the second uh, week of the lockdown. So I think uh, 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 the major challenge in today's time right now, even when we've started the uh, online classrooms, is that 80% of the students coming from the tier two and the tier three cities do not have laptops, do not have internet connectivities. Even when the world is talking about that the online education is at its and we all are preparing ourselves toward it. So I, uh, I leave this question to the panel. Of course, we're going to talk about it in the later part of the discussion that how are we going to address, of course, the LAS has taken a step towards it also. And uh, I'm going to talk about it uh, in the uh, panel discussion to move on. Thank you. Okay, I think um, it's a, one of the important points you uh, uh, pointed out here that do they have uh, systems and at times there's an issue of connectivity also, uh, if I'm uh, not wrong. Yeah. So uh, they, these are some issues in online teaching and I think we'll be discussing about them. I'll uh, now come to Dr. Rahul. Uh, das Gupta, trustee and director of Globsyn Business School. So, uh, Mr. Rahul, uh, what uh, is your institute all about and what are your views on this? Thank you. Thank you, Karthik. And um, welcome and good evening to all the panelists and, and those who are listening to us. Uh, so, Globsyn as an organization, uh, we are into essentially three businesses and one of them is in management education. And we have had our school for the last 19 years. We are right uh, next to IIM Calcutta in Kolkata, of course. Uh, we only specialize in uh, postgraduate education. Uh, so we have about 400 MBAs uh, studying with us, first and second year put together. Uh, we are very specific and very specialized in that area. Um, I think um, going back uh, last 40 days, I mean, the lockdown period incidentally has only been 40 days. Uh, it, it, it seems like a lifetime but it has only been 40 days. And I think many of us have gone through a lot of changes in terms of uh, like uh, what Sir was saying, uh, Bhaskar Sir was saying that, you know, things, uh, luckily for institutions like us, uh, you know, the virus has ensured people put in a little more effort and focus on change than what we have been trying to do for many, many years. And I'm sure that's the case with many of us as an institution. So I think this whole shift to online blended, uh, faculties participating in the whole learning process, students also, by the way, uh, participating in the learning process because in postgraduate education, you're dealing with adults. And if you look at adult learning, you can't force a kid to learn unless they want to. Intention of learning is a very important parameter, right? So no matter how good technology you have online, people may sign up for it, but how many will finish is a big, big challenge. So I think one of the things we, were, we have been busy working with is how do you really pedagogically change, you know, learning um, from a long-term perspective? How do you blend in the knowledge part of it, the experience part of it, the behavioral part of it, all three equally important in a postgraduate learning um, uh, sort of a program? How do you blend that and what bit should be used technologically? What bit should be used uh, more experientially in the campus? Uh, like it was mentioned by some of our panelists in the past, uh, like right before me, that you can't do everything offline. Uh, so what the ideal blending would be, those are the things which has actually kept us busy. Uh, also, you know, we had to start training our stakeholders, right? So we have a lot of corporates who come and engage with our students over, the, over a period of time. Things were scheduled all of a sudden. How do they now participate using technology? Which technology to use? So, you know, the learning curve has been uh, very fascinating for us as an institution in the last one month. Um, and I hope, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, what we'll come out with is probably a solution for the longer term where people and, uh, you know, both professors and students are able to engage both physically as well as virtually effectively. And that's our main focus, eff effective learning, where the retention is the same as it would be if it was in a physical environment. So that's what uh, we've been working on. That's right, uh, Mr. Rahul, uh, about effective learning, you stressed upon uh, in, the, in your introduction. And, and now I will request uh, Professor Christopher Abraham. He is CEO of Dubai Campus, SP Jain College of Management. He's talking to us from Dubai. And I think it's four o'clock right now, sir. There in Dubai. That's right, 4.17 to be more precise. 
Uh, good evening, fellow panelists and everybody who's listening across. It's just a pleasure that in spite of COVID and uh, in all kinds of uh, social distancing, technology can bridge the gap. So I'm thousands of miles away from you, but I can see each one of you, uh, you know, esteemed panelists. I represent a school that has uh, disrupted uh, business education in the last uh, 16 years. I come from SP Jain School of Global Management, a global Australian business school with uh, campuses in Dubai, Singapore, Sydney, and Mumbai. We have created history of sorts by becoming the youngest business school in the world to reach the top 100 in The Economist, to reach the top 100 in Financial Times twice, and to be ranked among the top five in the world uh, very recently by Times Higher Education and Wall Street Journal. And for the last seven years, been in the top 20 and top 10 in the Forbes rankings. Now, the question augurs, I mean, this is not about just personal boasting. And I've been part of the journey from day zero of the company. I've been one of the founding members of SPJ and Global. Now, one of the things that we observe is disrupting business education in the last 10 to 15 years. And one of the things we focused and invested was on technology. Now, so far, the good news. Now, let me give you some bad news. So a few years back when we launched technology, you know, with a lot of fanfare and expectations, uh, students, of course, were quite happy to lap it up because they are the glow generation. They are the digital generation. So it was easy for them to accept it and, uh, you know, lap onto it. Now, the biggest challenge we faced, with due respect to all my fellow teachers here, the biggest challenge was getting professors to imbibe the new technologies. And it wasn't happening. Let me be very honest, it was not happening. So we launched the smart board. Let me share a funny you know, incident which happened a few years back. Smart boards, a lot of fanfare. We put it as a PR news, you know, smart, all classrooms with smart boards. After three months of running the beta versions, you know, we checked with the IT team, okay, what's the usage of the smart boards? And the guy said, Prof, if I have to give you the secret, it's zero. Now that was kind of shocking because these boards are there and they're supposed to be used. And then we also realized every class had whiteboards, the old traditional whiteboards, which had replaced our blackboards in our time, right? And uh, we said, how do we get the professors to do it? And one of us came with this real wacky idea who said, let's remove the whiteboards and then see what happens. You know, this story is apocryphal, but it is very contextual now. So overnight in the weekend, you know, for us, the weekend is Friday, Saturday. So on Thursday night, we took the decision, Friday, Saturday, removed all the boards, whiteboards, and the only boards available were smart boards. And guess what? On Saturday, professors had to adapt, had to be agile, had to learn. They had to call up IT to get the support. Long story short, we had pretty much 80% assimilation of the smart technologies. Today, COVID has created a similar scenario. I think the digital generation is ready for it, ready for the revolution. The challenge is getting our professors, with due respect, I'm part of the fraternity, to imbibe these new technologies. Now, thanks to COVID, there's no other choice. Now, uh, you know, some of you are running institutions like us, and you know, you know, you have to run it from, and you, you would be now monitored, you'd be checked whether the classes have happened. And professors and teachers had to go all the way up to get this stuff done. So I think the number one thing is adaptability, agility, which are parts of human systems throughout. The other important lesson, I have a background in neuroscience, so I can tell you the awesome power of the human brain. Many times we underestimate it, but we have the power to recreate, reimagine, and redesign stuff. And as Professor Bharat rightly said, we have overcome the Spanish flu, we have overcome two world wars, we have come global recessions. We will come over it thriving, right? So that's the other important thing. The other thing that I want to put into the discussion is the power of human collaboration. We very often fail to realize that. Uh, you know, we brought this whole philosophy of competition, dog eat dog, so on and so forth. But there's plenty of anthropological and computational biological evidence that tells humans have thrived, not just survived, we have thrived because of our power to collaborate and cooperate. And here is a wonderful opportunity for all of us, including in the higher education and education, to come together as one single force, share best practices, collaborate on things that worked well. And I think together we can transform the future of higher education. I think these are very important learnings for us. And I want to end my opening remarks with this beautiful research. Many of you will be familiar, Professor Sugata's uh, uh, you know, research on the, um, the hole in the wall, where he demonstrated that rural kids with absolutely no educational background were able to play on computers and electronic devices, just allowing them the opportunity. So I think 
COVID again has presented, I do endorse and empathize with what Ms. Silky Jane said in terms of the availability of technology and internet and so on and so forth. So moving forward, one of the most important criteria would be to provide access, internet access to all. And then I think these things become, many of these things are now available free of cost. We'd be very happy to share a lot of free resources. And I think that's the way the world is going to go. Definitely there'll be blended versions. I'm not saying it'll all be online. But I think the world is now ready to take this up thanks to this pandemic. Right, Professor. And you're right that uh, at least in this one month, online was the only option like the smart boards uh, in your institute. And we had to uh, move towards that. And that's right. And uh, now I request uh, Mr. Abhay Gupta, uh, founder and CEO of a very uh, special name you have of your institute, sir, Luxury Connect Business School. So I will request you to introduce yourself and also about your institute and your views on this crisis. Thank you, Karthik. Good evening, panelists. Good evening, delegates. It's a pleasure to be here on amongst very learned people. And I'm already learning a lot of interesting facts about the education space by as spoken by Professor Christopher, Professor Bharat, Professor Rahul, Dr. Rahul, and Silky, of course. So uh, just to introduce ourselves, uh, as Karthik rightly said, we are a very niche school of business management, and we focus only on the luxury stream. Now, most of you may think that, why luxury management? But I firmly believe that as a society, uh, the world has always been controlled financially, as well as, uh, I would say, socially by the top layer of the pyramid. And unless the top layer of the pyramid spends, the bottom layer does not flourish. So while we have to thrive and survive, we have to ensure that the top layer continues to spend. After all, I, I believe major part of the global wealth is controlled by a very handful of people all over, all over the world. So uh, it is eventually the whims of these corporates, these people, which makes the economy go around. So while we, we say that consumerism begins at the bottom of the ladder, but I think it is induced and it is, it is majorly controlled by the people on the top. Unfortunately, in a market like India, where we have a lot of super rich and we have a growth factor of the HNIs at a very, very fast pace, not only amongst Asia, but even in the rest of the world, we do not have any institute which in, uh, tries to ensure that people on the top of the pyramid in India continue to spend within India. Most of the Indian wealth is spent outside India. So uh, my journey in, in, the, in the luxury space has been more destined than planned, and I'm not a planned educationist. I would say that uh, I have taken up life and challenge as it came by. And you'll be surprised to know that by core education, I am a marine engineer from Kolkata. So I am half Bengali that way because I spent the, the earlier years of my youth in, in Calcutta understanding marine engineering and understanding a lot of Bengali uh, culture. Nevertheless, uh, when the country was opening up, uh, and Narsimha Rao brought in, let's say, uh, the whole world into, into India. He started bringing in the year 1990. Uh, that's the time international brands started coming in. And my journey happened then when process engineering was not happening really in, in the softer side of the business, which means garments and fashion. And there was no NIFT at that point in time. So from that date till 2012, when I was heading, I brought in brands like from our lack cost to our Versace. I was eventually head, heading Versace in India with eight stores on a pan-India basis. I realized that one thing which was missing was talent. I had stores in Bangalore, in Calcutta, in Hyderabad, in Bombay, in Delhi, of course, and 32 luxury stores. We were the biggest then uh, in terms of uh, bringing in luxury fashion into India. I mean, fashion is, ge is generic, but we were doing watches, we were doing mobile phones, we were doing home and interiors, we were doing footwear, we were doing apparel. So it was a huge width of products that we were handling. And the, 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 the learning I had was that we could import the technology, we could import the, the merchandise, we could import the interiors, we could import the furniture, but what do we do with talent? So talent essentially had to be Indians. A survey done by us at that point in time in 2012 uh, around status of luxury talent in India, we found that the top talent of all these brands was still being imported. It is now recently in the last two, three years, you will find that uh, brands like a Lamborghini have an Indian guy heading it. Uh, BMW has an Indian guy heading it. Who unfortunately, just passed away last week. But it's in the last two years that the trend has changed. Whereas globally, Indian managers have been managing international corporates, as you know, from a Satya Nadella to a Indra Nui. I mean, top 10 managers have always been Indians. Unfortunately, when it came to India, the top management for minuscule luxury brands relatively was manned by a Johnny from Dubai or somebody else from 
Europe and Milan, and we Indians were not allowed to touch that. So that became a sort of a kick on my butt and said that why, if I can be as a franchise, if I can handle Versace in India, why can't somebody else manage these kind of brands? So my depth of research uh, took me into understanding how luxury is managed and what is the difference between our managers and their managers. That's how I got involved in the luxury education space. And we, we did a recce to understand as per, as per government of India norms, we require some 5.2 million people to manage luxury brands by the year 2022. So I saw that as a clear opportunity. And as a single individual investor, I decided to pump in my retirement uh, savings into creating this institute. So today we are eight years old and I might say, I can say with pride that after two, three years of, I think 2016, I believe, uh, sir, uh, SPJ and also brought up this uh, stream. So the market has expanded right. since SPJ and came into the uh, field. And I believe that uh, healthy competition brings in uh, opening up in the category. So uh, we are slowly and steadily into that. And we have now evolved into a, a space where we are offering uh, hybrid programs to other institutes. We're already tying up with other institutes because we believe that the volume of people required cannot be serviced by me alone. And I'm very glad that we have other institutes like SPGen, which have come in, but we are also offering the programs as modular programs to other colleges, other universities on, on a pan-India basis. And that is what led me to creating my first 100% video-based program about three years back. Unfortunately, as most of the panelists said that there is a poor acceptance. There was a poor acceptance in the education system fraternity when it came to offering the 100% the, the video-based programs. So most colleges that I interacted with, they said, we wanted to deliver it on an offline program. We are very fascinated by what you're saying, but we want it on an offline mode. It is humanly not possible. So now with, with COVID, I believe that the acceptance for online programs is beginning to happen because in the just one month of lockdown, the number of online licenses we have sold is something which we have not sold in the last three years. So uh, that shows that the general acceptance of the people uh, towards this is becoming necessity is the, is the mother of invention. So more and more people were serious about learning. But the challenge that I faced that while we have taken our programs online, I mean, our classes online as well, and the, and the lockdown happened where when our students were uh, still sitting in the term two final exams, they had to be packed off and sent home. Uh, and soon after we took, conducted the, the exams online using technology and classes delivery for the term three has started already online. The challenge that I see is that from a consumer perspective today, it is very difficult to hold anyone's attention. And when it comes to a student, adult or no uh, adult, his attention span is very short. It is restricted to four seconds. So if the faculty is not able to hold his attention in four seconds, the student is gone. And uh, if he's in a classroom mode, at least we are able to control that and we are able to try to bring him back to the topic on discussion. When he's in an online mode, we have no control over his movements. So while he might be visible there, his attendance is being marked, but his mind is wavering somewhere else. So uh, that's, a, that's a big challenge, I think, which the education industry needs to find ways and means to tackle. Because on the consumer part of the business, let the brand try to solve it. But as education leaders, it is our duty to ensure that our customer, which is the student, goes away with the value of learning, which we as a brand want to provide to him. So that I see is the, is the bigger challenge. Rest, I believe, uh, human race has always evolved and uh, always living with life jackets on. So I believe we will find a way to sail through this pandemic, which is definitely not an issue at all. So uh, I leave myself uh, with these remarks and happy to open up the debate further once we hear from other panelists as well. Thank you, so Mr. Gupta. Great to know. Uh, great to know. Thank you very much. Great to know that there is an opportunity also. I think that your story is clearly reflecting on that. And, but it comes with some challenges and I think um, you're right. Uh, I'll now move on to Dr. Akhil Sahani. He's Managing Director of the Sahani Group. Dr. Akhil, welcome and please uh, introduce us. Well, it's interesting you were talking about uh, the fact that COVID is a crisis, but uh, the Chinese character for crisis, Weiji, is also the same character for opportunity. <laughs> so where most people see a crisis, it's time we start looking at the opportunities. Let's talk a bit about myself and then I'll talk about where the opportunity is for everyone here. So the starting point is that uh, so my family has been in education for the last 60 years. My grandfather uh, co-founded a group of 24 colleges here in Mumbai uh, called the Hyderabad Sun Collegiate Board, some names like KC College, HR College, Sadhman Shani Engineering are known to some of you. Uh, I also uh, worked with a private equity fund 
that invested in education called Kaizen, one of the first funds that invested in the education sector uh, for the last 10 years. Then I started my own uh, company, which is a franchise group of colleges under the brand name Tadaman Shani, which is supported by an edtech platform that uh, teaches courses through around mobile apps on Android. So the combination of uh, online and offline blended with a full fed placement. Uh, my doctorate is in employability from the University of Liverpool. So that will actually have informed a lot of our education methods. So uh, also I do have, I'm the chairman of a group of schools called Global Study Schools, which are around 20 schools around uh, India. But okay, that is my background. But let's talk a bit about the opportunity part because at the end of the day, nobody wants to talk so much about themselves. Let's start with the online aspect. Now, the thing is, is that the opportunity for all our educators here in the audience is that we need to stop doing the classic chalk and talk lecture PowerPoint based method of education, because frankly, it's not cutting it anymore, right? The, pro the reason why a lot of institutions are not able to capture the students attention online is because the lecturers are still doing the same thing. They say they have a standard PowerPoint, they'll present the PowerPoint on the system and they'll just talk over it. And at the end of one hour, it is boring and students are falling asleep. There are ways to maintain student attention. So what we immediately did is that we told all our lecturers, A, you're not going to use PowerPoint. You cannot use PowerPoint because that forces you to start just doing boring stuff. What we do is that we say you need to basically talk for, let's say, five minutes on a concept, put on an online poll, ask the students questions, point to a student by name and say, okay, like, what do you think? What do you think? Because then you have the student on their toes. In fact, we have a uh, online, we actually have a guide for online teaching that we've been sharing with colleges and institutions around India. And I'm, I'm actually going to share the link to that guide uh, on the chat here so you all can download it. We also ran a webinar to teach people how to conduct uh, online classes. We're happy to say that through the methods, and we do a lot of uh, background on behavioral sciences. In fact, our focus is behavioral sciences and data. But I've also done some studies in the behavioral sciences. So we actually understand how human beings interact. So if you're able to maintain their attention online and also make them interested and more importantly, interactive, you will not lose students. And that's worked very well for us because we actually have got, we actually track around, uh, let's say we have class of 30 students at a time. We have very, very few dropout rates. And if we do, we also call them up on WhatsApp, say what's going on, why are you not on the class? Why is your video not on? Why is your audio not on? Why are you not looking at though you are interactive? Why not answering questions? So the more you're interacting with the students, you're changing their behavior. So that's one side. Our online admissions have not changed much. We actually have uh, shifted our call center away from a single office to uh, working from home. We're using a lot of uh, technology like Microsoft Teams and a few other technologies which already exist out there to actually manage our uh, team. We also have something called Bitrix, which is to manage projects and task management. This stuff is not easy. It's not difficult to implement. It's just a matter of the senior leadership of our organization to make the effort to explore it. We all need to change our method of working. You cannot go back to the old method of working even after lockdown is over, right? So that's one thing I'm gonna talk about from the institution point of view. The other point of view from the edtech entrepreneur's mindset is that edtech sector is now hot. I know a lot of venture capitalists, I'm an angel investor myself. There are a lot of VCs and private equity funds are saying we actually now want to look at Indian education technology as the next big thing. In fact, edtech has really got a golden moment. Again, I know it's a tragedy of COVID. Let's not, uh, let's not discount that. But if you are an edtech player, if you're not able to raise money and scale up your company in the next one year, you frankly have lost it because there's a lot of money coming into edtech. Let me also point uh, one thing about edtech. When you look at the edtech industry, don't look at America as an example. Look at China. The, the 10 largest no. listed education companies in the world, are, uh, out of them, seven are Chinese. Four of them are the New York Stock Exchange, and most of us have never heard of them. What is similar with China and India is the fact that we all have a very large middle class. We all have a great amount of respect for education. That means in India, if you drop a textbook, immediately you pick it up and you'll do that slam. No other country in the world does that except China. And of course, in China, they also have the tough uh, exams that people mug to get into. Because of that, China, the Chinese edtech market has exploded and it is larger than any other edtech market in the world. India is roughly two, three years behind it, but we now have a chance to leapfrog into that. So I would say that if you are in the edtech space, go crazy and scale up. If you are a brick and mortar institute, please start incorporating technology, become digital first, 
you cannot be left behind anymore. The, it's like the classic Darwinian thing. The people who adapt will survive. Frankly, there will be a few, unfortunately, there will be fewer institutions in the next uh, seven, eight years. The ones who survive will be the ones who actually adapt to technology and digital. You can't go back to the old normal anymore. That's it. Right, Dr. Akhil, EdTech is something which is very important and prominent now uh, post -COVID, in the post-COVID world. I will now request um, Professor Rao, President of Institute of Advanced Research is in Gandhi Nagar. Sir, please introduce us. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, uh, the panelists and the audience. Thank you very much indeed for sparing your time. Um, this is an important time for all of us. Um, I could easily escape from all this by saying whatever I wanted to say has already been said by my previous panelists. So now I really have to work hard to say something that adds value here. Um, I am a director of a company in the UK. That's where I'm from. Um, the company has got a, a large education charity with 1,000 uh, schools in Nepal. Um, some schools up north in India, and we are building a research intensive university in Gandhinagar in Gujarat. Um, most of my life was uh, in academia. I, uh, I was a professor uh, in engineering, but last 20 years I was basically running universities, including a distance education university in New Zealand called Massey University. Um, so I cannot pretend that I know a lot about uh, the situation uh, in India and its development because I've been back here only last 18 months. But uh, I can share with you what uh, I experienced elsewhere and what a little bit I have learned so far. Um, so part of my um, objective today is not just to share what I know, but also to learn from you all and see how we, I may be able to bring something together. Um, whether it is ed tech, um, digital or face-to-face, -face, the primary mission of the educator has not changed. That is to prepare our young people so that they are professionally and intellectually able, um, but they're also prepared um, ethically and emotionally for life outside the university. Now, this is fundamental. Um, if we simply focus on discipline-focused science or history or philosophy or technology, we are doing a disservice to the students. Um, if I'm educating a young person today, I'm educating that person for their next 50, 60 years of their life, not just to pass the exam and get a degree. So this is a huge challenge as educators for us. Um, we know what we know today, but we have an, a responsibility to project what the future is likely to be. Um, now, these kinds of perturbations in the system, whether it is COVID or 2008, or indeed whatever, a major earthquake, natural disasters, whatever they are, they are basically um, the perturbations which help us in a way to reset the direction. Now, if we do not actually reset those directions, we may end up somewhere else other than where we want to be. So let me tell you a little bit about what I'm doing here. This research intensive university at the moment is a very small institution, started as a research institute, um, but subsequently was made into a university. So, but the ethos remains, uh, majority of our students are still postgraduate students, masters and PhDs. Um, so we come with a slightly different angle. How do we actually take research and turn that into uh, education uh, of young people? And that, is, that itself is a different kind of challenge, the research teaching nexus, if you like. Um, while we do that, we also are conscious that uh, this is a university. There are standard rules to follow, whether they are UGC guidances or 
Um, we are in Gujarat, so Ministry of Education, Department of Education guidance, they need to be internalized, but they are not mutually exclusive. Um, let me perhaps now focus on what people have already said. Uh, the two words that have come about, one is technology, the other is adaptability. Technology moves roughly an order of magnitude faster than the ability of human being to adapt. Now, this is the biggest challenge really um, that we need to deal with. Um, deal with we will, we have to, we must. Um, it's reconciling our ability to learn in order to adapt to the changing environment. And essentially these days driven by rapid progression of technology. So yes, there are limitations in terms of access to technology. Uh, every young person, whether it is in a village or in a city in India has got a, a smartphone. Um, the connectivity is actually is getting better and better. Where we have challenges are probably the broadband and the speed and variability. But at the moment, the technology, as best as I can assess in India, is good enough for us to be able to deliver what we can and should be able to. There are fantastic example we, examples we can learn from. Uh, my university, I gave an example in New Zealand. Uh, the, or an Australian university called University of New, New England. Uh, or University of Phoenix. Um, university of um, Athabasca in Canada. Um, these are all long established distance education universities. Um, whether it was WebCT or Blackboard or now a whole host of online platforms that are available. They all offer all kinds of opportunities for interface between human beings, which is what actually we have been missing in terms of technology. It is not about simply uploading our PowerPoints or uh, written text, but it is about engaging in a multi-degree uh, interaction. And today technology allows that. So I'm very confident that we'll make progress, notwithstanding some of the challenges we currently face with access and so on. But in my view, the access is actually at the moment good enough, even in India, to do much better than what we are currently doing in terms of using technology for education. Right, right Professor. Um, technology is the thing you are uh, rightly said, and you will uh, also for, uh, stressing upon the challenges which we'll be facing, especially in the human interface. Uh, in this technology, uh, but uh, uh, after introduction from all of you, um, we need to innovate. We need to use edtech, and we need to see opportunity. Uh, uh, this is the consensus of all of you in this discussion. But again, I will um, come back to a very basic question, a very basic worry about the institute. Also, on also the audience uh, would be interesting interested to know about the admissions. Uh, all these things uh, uh, needs admissions. Uh, so, uh, Silky, if I ask you that, uh, how do you see the scenario of admission, and how will it affect the admission scenario? And, uh, yeah. So, thank you, Karthik. So, just uh, before stepping to admissions, uh, I would like to just sum up quickly what the Professor Christopher, Doctor Akhil, and also uh, Professor Rao has talked about the tech. I was not about to bring that uh, in this conversation, but uh, it's, I think it's a good uh, uh, platform. So uh, like uh, Professor Christopher was saying that it is hard to keep the students uh, uh, in, in, in with the faculties while the lecture has been given. So you're very correct in that uh, terms. The one question which I'd raised was the internet connectivity and uh, no laptops with the students. So while we progressed in this 40 days of uh, lockdown, and to answer you, uh, Akhil, in this, that uh, we, in uh, association with a startup uh, called as iAugmenta Labs, have uh, come up with a, a technology uh, which, in which the faculties will be given a, a, a hand where they can uh, shorten their chapters into basic topics. 
and they can upload their sessions onto this app. So here, how better things happen? So here, we are covering four major aspects in this app, uh, which is like uh, the first is the infrastructure because we know everyone in India has a mobile app today. So of course, you can uh, use it; it's friendly. Secondly, here we are getting into the micro learning. Uh, Christopher, sir, this is for you. So uh, if the micro learning a, a professor can upload a one-minute session. A five-minute session, a twenty-minute session. Nobody is stopping him. The third is that we are monitoring that also. We have come up with an LMS uh, along with this that every faculty and the head of the departments can see that uh, students are going through their sessions or not. And the best part in this is that students are not time bounded. If they have the connectivity good in the morning, they can do that. If they are wanting to study in the Date in the evening, they can do that. We are not creating a timetable. The only timetable what we are creating here is that once the content is over for the particular chapter, then an online session can come for the Q and A. That can be resolved. And the fourth uh, major thing which we have come up in this app is the assessment part, which is definitely very important. So we are we have kept it that uh, of course uh, the assessment can happen uh, like chapter wise also and we can even have scheduled examinations uh, on this of course temporarily because we are working so we have only kept objective uh, questions into the picture but uh, like if we say on 13th of May we want to conduct an examination of beta computer science so we will be at 10 a.m. Uh, for the entire batch we will be able to do that and in fraction of seconds after the examination is over we'll also get the results also in hand so i the, because uh, you guys were talking about tech tech so i thought to bring in uh, this uh, platform also to you guys so of course this is not the end of course this is uh, this is just one of the aspect which i uh, was talking about and karthik one more thing before uh, touching the admissions i think uh, here we are talking about as uh, as leaders about uh, learning and uh, to my feel i am i'm i'm little in a fear right now that uh, the kind of dilemma in which our students and our parents are currently i'm sure each one of us uh, will agree with that because uh, i been into higher education and uh, uh, i my students are from the first years are 18 or 19 years of age the psychology for which they had entered this college the last uh, where they had taken admission with me was not just to have a degree they also tulas being a beautiful campus they wanted to sit in the library they wanted to play sports they wanted to practice cultural activities they were sitting in the library uh, they were attending events a lot of things so when we used to talk earlier about learning it was an overall development about the student i don't know how come in the lockdown period everyone is just talking about completing the syllabus and we are conducting online uh, sessions through a google classroom or through a zoom platform is is still the learning happening or not that's that's the question we all need to sit back and discuss and come up with a solution because we being leaders we can't just left leave the students and parents in the situation of dilemma that okay what next Uh, so i think that's uh, what is one of my because uh, that's what they had taken admission and uh, coming to your question that they can show uh, as we all know i i went to uh, like engineering uh, bba or uh, diploma courses or agriculture for that matter currently like uh, 12 uh, examinations of cbsc uh, one paper is still left of course uh, jwe examinations haven't happened the medical entrance examinations haven't happened so uh, we currently do not have the guidelines for the from the government because i think your institutions can't take an individual approach and start giving admissions i think we need to have like earlier before the lockdown we again need to have a channelized way how we going to move progr uh, progress on this so uh, but as far as the providing information to the students providing career counseling sessions we definitely are doing that and so that students can also feel confident that where exactly they are going to be taking admissions it is there in front of uh, them but uh, of course admissions is going to be a bigger challenge which i think each one of us will face this year 2020 it's not going to be as easy though i think no year was easy for any one of us uh, into this industry every year taught us some of the other lessons but 2020 it's going to be very very different yeah over right to you. right miss silky i think um, you uh, stressed upon learning and that how actually we will make learning possible in this scenario that's right uh, 
but but I, why I was asking about admissions because the, there is uncertainty uh, in this environment about uh, admissions. Also, I will request Professor Bhaskar, uh, sir. Uh, uh, I am just one of the institutes where uh, Indian youth is uh, or youth uh, or youth around the world is uh, very specifically focused to take admission in. What will be the change in I am admission scenario? Uh, I think for our uh, what you call the flagship program. Admission is not going to be impacted in a major way, but the when do we start session, how do we synchronize that uh, process with the incoming stream is a bigger issue. We have normally complete our admission uh, process, meaning all the activities related to that way back in uh, February and before lockdown period. I know some of my colleague IAMs had few centers left for the interview, but they're conduct conducting it online right now. So they would have also completed that in online fashion. So we will be ready with our result. I think uh, I don't want to name one of, one of the IM events is saying that they'll announce the results next week. Although we have been telling that no point announcing results now because the exams have not happened for the engineering stream yet or uh, even Delhi University and many universities, uh, which is our incoming stream. But what is of major concern right now uh, uh, for us is when do we really start the session? And reason for that is we cannot start our session till the final year exams are in place for it in community. Although some IMs have hold the view and many people hold the view that let them come next year. We will have enough streams still coming in which has one plus year experience so they already graduated. And I think there's a huge amount of, uh, but that we a bit of a biased admission in a sense that we are denying opportunity. Uh, and it brings out to an open, an open another debate, which IAMs always go through. Should we provide education to these fresh students or we should always take experienced students in? But since our practice has been experienced to, uh, fresh to students as well, so this year that challenge still remains. And that's why we may have to start delayed session. Uh, right. That is one of the biggest impact in our admission, uh, not really an admission process, but impact of uh, all this that when do our admission process concludes and we are able to move forward. Exactly. So, uh, Professor, uh, about uh, after admissions, I think uh, this uh, point for uh, stress upon by Silky about learning. So, uh, Professor Christopher, I would like to ask you that uh, these schools and technical institutes are generally about vocational training, you know, vocational uh, training to a person, uh, a business training. So, it uh, in this online scenario, how uh, this training will be imparted now, you know, how difficult it will become or, or easy. You are on mute, Professor. Okay, thank you very much. And, uh, you know, amazing conversation that we're having great ideas from our fellow panelists. Now, let me put a context to this uh, question that you asked. Uh, we need to be very clear what we educate our people. Uh, because very often, what we teach or what we make them, enable them to learn, would make a difference in the careers, in their lives, in their ventures. Now, uh, a few years back, uh, every two years rather, the World Economic Forum publishes a very interesting list. Uh, it might be, some of you may be familiar, it's called the skills, top skills for 2020. And they've already published it in 2015, they revised it in 2016, it's available on their website. And it's a very simple checklist of 10 critical skills that we need every student to be equipped with, whether high school, whether college, business school, technical, vocational, whatever. And interestingly, if you see each of these skills, they are more to do with the human side of things rather than the technology. So you look at collaboration, you look at uh, critical thinking, you look at problem solving, you look at people management, you look at service orientation, You'd look at something called cognitive flexibility, which is the ability of the brain to think differently, so on and so forth. Uh, and I think that's critical. So every educational institution worth its salt in the 2020 post-COVID scenario probably needs to revisit its curriculum, uh, revisit what it teaches and see it against the backdrop of those skills. Now, I keep researching this very often because, as you rightly said, admissions is a huge uh, area for us. Career counseling linked to that, the challenges that students face uh, is a very, very you know, important thing. So I stumbled upon another very interesting thing, which was again put in on the World Economic Forum uh, you know, website, 
which is what they call the six intelligences in a post-COVID era. Uh, now, these are very interesting. One of it is contextual intelligence. So how do you derive knowledge and intelligence from what's happening around you? Do you panic and have a knee-jerk reaction? Or do you look at it very practical and see how you can move your way forward? So that's contextual. Then moral intelligence, which is the ethical way of doing things. In spite of all the things that happen around, can I still be you know, very clear in terms of our models and ethics? Third one is the oft-repeated emotional and social intelligence. The fourth one, they call it generative intelligence, which is nothing but innovation and design thinking. How do you generate ideas in a very challenging, uncertain world? Fifth one is technical intelligence, which we today call digital transformation, uh, digital knowledge, whatever you want to call it. And the sixth one is transformative intelligence, which is the decisions that we take now will transform the future of humanity. And I think these are extremely critical. Again, we need to keep that mirror of the six intelligences. Are we preparing our students for these intelligences? Because a curriculum, if you see, you know, many of us are from business schools. If you take our curriculum vis-a-vis -vis another curriculum from another school, it's pretty much similar. Economics, marketing, human resources, accounting. The real differentiator, I think, is the skill sets. And uh, as uh, Dr. Akhil and the others said, you know, it's not the content. Because PowerPoint is, there's, there's a very interesting term, by the way, death by PowerPoint. So I think we should stop murdering our students with death with PowerPoint. Uh, the key word, as again, some of our panelists said, is engagement. How do you engage an 8-year-old or an 18-year-old or even a 48-year-old executive MBA? Because he is equally part of the digital generation and their uh, you know, attention spans are very short. So how do you engage them? So engage learning. You know, interestingly, uh, one year back, we launched a very interesting technology. I'll put that on for the panelists. It's called ELO. ELO is Engaged Learning Online. Now, this was cutting edge technology. Again, there were few takers because everybody wanted face-to-face. -face. Everybody wanted the real classroom experience. But boy, when COVID hit us, ELO became like hotcakes because everybody had to now learn how to use it. And it is very engaging because one of the challenges that we face in online is, is it boring? Is it morbid? Is it in a very uh, monotonous? But I think we can make that very engaging by two or three things. One is what he said in terms of, I mean, what uh, Ms. Silky said in the micro learning part. So our modules, our entire 90 minute session is divided into 10 minute sections, 10 minutes followed by an activity, 15 minutes followed by a poll. So there's something that you do on an ongoing basis. You don't make it monotonous. That all the chalk and talk is gone. I think we need to forget that completely. Uh, you know, it's still a hangover for a lot of us, but we need to kill that. And then we have the Socrative. Socrative is a software, by the way. You know, Socratic, Socrates many years back, many centuries back, taught us the power of questions, question and answers. Unfortunately, and we are all villains in this, you know, all academics, we have killed the power of questioning from our little kids. You know, there's a lot of research, disturbing rather. Kids, when they start talking from two years onwards, ask a lot of questions. But as they progress, when they come into school, suddenly the number of questions dramatically reduces to zero. The reason is teachers say, we will ask you the questions you answer. Parents say, Papa and Mama say, shut up. You know, we don't have all the answers. And then we have killed that power to be curious and ask questions. So thankfully, today, there are a couple of very interesting ones. I'll put that on the, you know, on the chat for you. It's called the Right Question Institute a US-based institute that actually encourages us to ask questions, to develop the power to ask the right kind of questions. That's one. And the software level, there's a software called Socrative, where you can embed the kind of questions that you want to ask your students while the session is on. And I think this is extremely critical that we engage them. So ELO, Socrative, uh, Right Question Institutes, I think these are the way forward. Uh, we do have a challenge, as uh, Professor Bharat said, the similar kind of challenge we face because of the freshers joining the mainstream. Freshers don't even have the final grades. So we have offer letters gone out, but we can't release them because uh, they don't have the grades, final grades. So what we have done technically is the main intake has been postponed by a couple of months because there's no other choice. We don't know when the results will come. So we would probably be shifting it by a few months. Uh, and yes, the other challenge is students are you know, concerned. What's going to be the future? I think the future... As Dr. Akil rightly said, COVID has opportunity written in large. We have to see that opportunity. Tell them that, you know, it's not the end of the world. It's not paranoia. Uh, there are ways to look at this. Look at where the opportunities lie. Link it with the skills and intelligences that we now need to train our, you know, future generations on. And I think that's the way forward. 
Uh, those right. would be my thoughts on this. Right, Professor. But uh, I think there's one advantage of uh, chalk and talk method was that uh, uh, solving the problem of attention. Teachers just needed to throw a chalk. No, but no, no, I beg to <laughs> disagree. I'll tell you why. No, no. See, because this yellow, and I'll put the link for you so that you can see it. I can actually see if my student is listening to me or is he playing on the mobile. Right. It's kind of, it's, a, it's like what they call the surveillance capitalism. But you have to snoop on them to see whether they are engaged. I mean, we are doing it for the right reasons. You're right. Exactly. But otherwise, it, it won't work. And you have to keep asking. You know, Socrates is again about asking questions. Harvard has mastered this. They call it, you know, name calling. They call it uh, without, uh, you know, cold telling call. them. The cold calling. Exactly. So I think uh, that's the way forward. There's no choice. Karthik, I wanted to add something to what Professor Abrams was talking about. Yes. yes. Uh, wonderful thing about uh, what he just talked about is that in online education, lots of things change. As he talked about the death of PowerPoint, etc., and so on. One of the fundamental things that characteristics he was talking about a management graduate has to imbibe in them. All those characteristics are normally imbibed in that classroom environment with the interaction amongst the student and creating the dynamics in the classroom. And that we usually do through the case teaching method. And one of the most important tools used in management education is the case tool. Now, when we move this case tool to online environment, it becomes a different kind of a challenge. So what we are doing, we are training our faculty because case teaching can be done very effectively. Actually, I find, and you know, my online classes, I do case teaching for, uh, uh, in the online environment, very effectively. And sometimes I find it more effective actually than the, not in the uh, real classroom environment. Because in a real classroom environment, there's a bit of a factor of embarrassment in the student, whether I should pose this question or not. While in the most of the platforms, when you are using the case uh, for the case analysis, there's a chat box and a hand raising going on. Mm -hmm. And you as a professor has to actively engage in the chat along with them. Because all kinds of questions will be coming in and then pick up the chat and con continue the conversation. Second part, we have to change our classrooms. We have not done it completely. When our studio has to have a 50 to 60 students and their pictures sitting online and those hand raising, etc. in the technology not coming in the chat box, but on the screen itself. So slight change in the technology and retraining of our faculty, how to interact because, because in a classroom you are alert in, with a different kind of senses. Here your eyes are the only senses. And you have to be alert looking at multiple views and factors which are coming in, how engaged the students are, what is that curiosity getting driven in them, and allowing that interaction amongst the student to develop in the, in the online environment. Right. In a classroom, they can look at each other. Here, they are able to look at it only in a flat screen environment. You don't have a three-dimensional classroom. Maybe next phase of the virtual technology will be that we'll have a three-dimensional classrooms uh, through the virtual technology as well. But as of now, we have to retrain ourselves. And that's what we are going through. Some of us have taught online case teaching methodology. So we are training all our faculty colleagues, interacting with each other, holding the faculty classes. One of us does the case discussion in the classroom environment where the rest of the faculty is a participate as a student. So we're learning from each other and what, some of the innovations we have to do, rather than waiting that somebody will devise and do it for us, we ourselves have to devise those new mechanisms and make this online education as effective in that case as the classroom education is going to be. Rightly said, with good orientation, uh, we can have better results uh, also in terms of engagement uh, through online education. Now, uh, because of positive of time, I will uh, go to one more important question comes in my mind and we'll take some relevant questions about the internship and placement. I think these two things are very different in this scenario because placement is a one-time affair for a student but internships come uh, every year or something like that. So I'll uh, request Dr. Rahul that uh, firstly what will be the, uh, sorry Mr. Rahul, uh, I beg your pardon. Uh, what will be the internship scenario now? Because a remote internship or something like that is in the you know in news nowadays. So yeah. uh, what about internships now in this online scenario? So, you know, so um, I think, um, I mean, we are governed by AICT for our programs uh, and NBA. So I think uh, in, in our case, uh, what needs to happen is that AICT has now uh, made it mandatory for all internships to be remote uh, this year. 
or to be held at a later date. So what one of the things we have done is we had almost finished off our uh, internship alignment by the time, uh, you know, I think 24th uh, of March happened uh, for many of us. And I think what now we are doing is most of the organization, we had to give the organization some breathing time to also figure themselves out because everybody got into the shop. But now we have already seen organizations stepping forward with a lot of projects given by them, uh, which can be done, which are more research oriented. Uh, and probably a lot of organizations need that right now uh, across all sectors. And we already have, a re so we have about 180 students uh, right now who have to be put into internships. So we have already covered about 110 of them, uh, restructured internships. So we still have about 70 to go. Uh, but I think, uh, I think that institutions will step forward. I, everybody is in the same boat. They understand that nobody would, would not want to utilize a youngster, be sharp and bright, uh, you know, in terms of research and development. So I think we don't, uh, we foresee hopefully things going forward in another few months. And luckily for us, COVID has happened when the SIP period is. It's not that if it was, if it was in the middle of a uh, session and internship was coming up, I think it would have been a little more challenging. But the fact that it happened right around the corner uh, and if institution had their internships allocated, I think uh, reallocation uh, for us, at least in my experience, has not been a major challenge. Um, obviously, there are challenges in certain sectors like banking and others where typically, uh, you know, banks would uh, recruit interns to do more, uh, let's say, uh, a field work or let's say FMCG companies. But they're also slowly giving a lot of research projects to these youngsters. Um, it may take another two, three weeks for us to realign, but that's not a, a major, major challenge. I think placements uh, perhaps would be something that we have to watch out for. Um, but there also, I feel that, um, you know, so we finished our placements in February um, and we are obviously concerned in terms of uh, offers getting retracted, you know, in terms of people who have given offers to youngsters who feel that their the companies, you know, for whatever reason they want to go through restructuring. So one of the things we are doing uh, right now is we have gotten them to be working and engaging with those companies as uh, remote interns before their offer letter kicks off. So one, the idea was if you have been selected by an organization, start working with them in whatever format possible, whether it's through webinars, there, every organization has, is having webinars as well, right? So we have tried to align our students who have been pre-offered already to start engaging with the organizations. In addition to that, one of the things that we are doing is, uh, you know, we are also reskilling and upskilling some of these youngsters who have been offered already. This is a great time because things will change uh, once things normalize, right? So we are trying to tell our youngsters who have the job opportunities to look at courses. So we have a partnership in Globsyn with um, HBS uh, for all their online programs with Harvard. So, you know, so what we do is that's also integrated into our curriculum also to begin right. with. But there are courses uh, by famous professors mm -hmm. like Leighton on disruption, for example. You know, right. many of our uh, second years are taking those courses now because they have to be starting to think differently, right? right. So we have recommended them to get into those kind of programs. So I think uh, there's part of uh, reskilling happening for the second years who've been placed. And for the first years getting into SIP, I think we are, they're just waiting to get projects and, um, you know, sort of uh, get engaged in, in two, three weeks. I also, last point I want to mention here on the SIP and the full-time placement. I think, you know, it's an opportunity as well because, you know, what will happen is large organizations will look at cost cutting. And if you have a youngster who is talented, who, who is otherwise done well, if your school has a good pedagogy in terms of delivery and the student has genuinely learned well, um, I think there's a, a competitive advantage he, would he or she would have vis be somebody who is very exp expensive, whether that person is currently working in an organization and it could be a replacement opportunity for, for a youngster, or it could be, you know, where an institution uh, uh, or an organization is recruiting somebody at a much higher price and is willing to come down but not compromise on the talent uh, in terms of what he or she would get. So I think my recommendation to my team and, other, and the youngsters have been, you know, reskill, upskill yourself uh, if you want to stay relevant. So that's what we are doing right now with the SIPs and placements. Right, right. I think placement is, a, uh, uh, is an issue. Uh, very quickly, I would like to ask Dr. Sani, what is your take on this issue of placements uh, in this oh, area? All right. So let, let, me, uh, uh, let me take a step back first and say that uh, we focus on employability, not placement. I'll tell you what the difference is. Employability means basically the ability to get a job and hold a job and be successful at a job on a long-term basis. Focusing just on placement means we're just concerned about the first job. 
who cares about the second? How do we make sure the second, third, fourth? How do we make them successful in life? So what we said is that right from the beginning, and again, our focus is we we, we work at British universities, by the way. So our we're more focused on developing personality uh, skills more than just uh, imparting knowledge. So what we said is that to make the student employable, we need to build up a certain amount of drive and self motivation and a certain sense of professional responsibility in their own life. That means instead of them saying, "Well, fine, now I've, I've paid you money for a fee, now give me an internship, now give me a job," we flip the model. What we said is that look, if you want to be employable. We, you need to start finding your own internships. What we've also done, we've been working on uh, online internships long before COVID. In fact, we partnered with uh, a lot of intern uh, websites like Let's Intern, uh, Oyster Connect, a lot of others, which you probably all are familiar with, where companies are posting internships online and students are able to do projects. So while their semester is going on, they are supposed to do an internship while they're studying. That means that when they move into their summer vacation, they immediately have the ability to find their own internship through their own contacts. Don't forget is that with the new work from home environment, a lot of managers will start having to deal with people anyway through remote methods. So getting these people to start being managed for projects through remote methods is great learning for the corporate environment. Same logic with the uh, placement. Again, it's not basically, okay, we, it's our job to get placement for them. We encourage them and we facilitate them to identify the companies that they want and proactively go after the companies. I'll tell you why it's important, because the thing is the more they work to build up their own placement, the more they talk to companies, the more they research companies. Let's say, for example, they say, we, okay, I, want, I asked them in the beginning of the semester, what is your dream company? So for example, somebody said, I want to join Google. So I said, okay, fine. What is it that Google wants? What are the sort of positions that Google has for, let's say, MBAs or BBAs, you also offer BBAs? And what is it you need to be to make sure that you get that job? So the student has to is responsible to actually go to find out from Google on, Tom, on the website or finding on the online information, what is it that Google's looking for from an employee? Then I tell the kid, okay, look, this is what Google wants. Are you that person? What are you going to do in this term or this semester to make yourself that person? And we facilitate that person through one-to-one -one mentoring, through a lot of uh, career development activities to make sure that they uh, get into Google. And then we tell them, okay, look, you apply to Google. Why the heck should we make the appointment for you? We will support you, we will su but you need to make the effort yourself. So anyway, so I'm, I'm, obviously I'm extending too much, but the point is, is that we've not had much of a problem with internship or placement. Yes, companies have actually given offer letters and said, okay, we will uh, maybe delay the uh, physical start of the job. But again, like what uh, Raul said, is that we're engaging these students with the companies. They are, uh, we said, okay, look, even until uh, they join, let them do some free projects again. We start getting used to them. Let them start getting used to you and seamlessly get them in. So, so far, we've been okay. Right, Dr. Sani. Uh, now I'll take up some of the questions. I think uh, there's one question for Mr. Abhay Gupta. There's one question for you from Lavi Sharma that uh, coronavirus has a huge impact on luxury industry. Like Italy is uh, highly affected because of the lockdown. So how do you see the future of, future, future of uh, luxury industry in India post this COVID-19 and what is the... Uh, how will it impact uh, institutes like yours? Well, it's a great question, uh, Ravi. The, the fact of the matter remains that luxury industry uh, through the past has proven itself to be recession-free and crisis-free. And I'm not talking of recent history. I'm talking of history. If you go into hundreds of years of history, post the Spanish flu, post the World War, post the 2008 recession, and maybe post the 2012 recession, luxury has been one of the fastest ones to bounce back. Even today, as we speak, uh, China is already experiencing what is termed as uh, revenge shopping phenomena. And we as an organization are, were the first ones to conduct uh, a, a very widespread uh, uh, research to understand the impact of uh, coronavirus on the Indian luxury industry. So uh, the fact of the matter remains that you're right that the supply side has been hit, but the demand side is strong. Now, how the demand side is going to be fulfilled is that most of the retailers, most of the brands are sitting on stocks which they have not been able to sell for the past 40, 45 days. So the seasonal stock is carrying forward with them. And immediately, as soon as we believe, I mean, our research says that around Rakhi and around Puja, Diwali Puja time, uh, the fear of COVID will begin to subside and consumerism will come back again. Now, you might question that in this era of, of a time where people are talking of essentials, luxury is not essential. So I agree with you that Luxury is not a need-based uh, phenomena, it's a desire-based phenomena. But you have to now imagine the top of the pyramid where 
their benchmarks have been luxury and they are not going to lower their benchmarks so has their uh, financial position been impacted well to a certain extent their reserves have been impacted but not impacted enough for them to lower the benchmarks second thing what is going to happen is perhaps the quantity is going to be taken over by quality so more and more qualitative inputs are going to happen so you might buy two shirts instead of four shirts if you are buying in a month so that is where the phenomena is going to uh, going to change so the industry is not going to slow down on a large scale the industry will have a temporary setback and then you will find things coming back so my research says that beauty skin care wellness wines liquors hanging out those are the areas which are going to bounce back immediately and uh, you have witnessed to the fact that i think karnataka or somebody opened the liquor shop and then they had to shut down within few hours so wine and liquor yes, is going to be well. one area because we are all starved of uh, let's say meeting our friends and and is giving you know after all you know everyone has been talking about the zoom technology and online technology but we also have to agree to the phenomena that it is zooming us all out eventually we need the human touch and we need the human connection and it's like trying to exercise alone instead of going to the gym most of us go to the gym because we like the environment there and not because we can't do the exercise on our own but the fact is we just can't do it on our own we need to you know we we see each other and the energy the energy which is built up in a classroom energy which is built up in a gym is extremely important so retail, retail is also about entertainment so that is going to remain true maybe it, uh, it may take time but it will remain rightly said by you uh, uh, there is one interesting question i would like to uh, uh, request professor rao to react on that uh, guru mantra has asked that could we have a fully digital institute in the future totally digital maybe artificial intelligence for teaching so is there any scope of a fully digital institute in future um the 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 answer is yes we are not yet there there are institutions that are substantially digital at the moment for example the uh, online education based universities athabasca for example in canada has got quite a large number of their programs fully digitized now when i say digital it is actually interactive digital not not simply communicate um, um, communication through digital platform it is interaction through digital platform so if you talk of examinations they are actually uh, individualized exams not a standard exam for all students um the university of new england is just started progressing that way so the answer is yes it will happen um but my view is that uh this is only my view that it will still need to be supplemented with activities that will help the personal development of in, um students because the students learn as much from each other the peer learning as they learn from the professors so the, the that bit of peer learning is not yet perfected on digital platforms the communication is but not the peer learning so there is some development to take place but we are progressing um fairly rapidly towards a complete um digital university framework um ai use is a different issue um the ai um, i have my own views i would love to be challenged on this artificial intelligence is not a panacea um artificial intelligence is based on data um any system that depends on data by definition is past so we can use data to pr- predict um that there's no guarantee of the prediction without validation so there are some limitations to with uh, with ai uh, ai is a fantastic tool it must be used it will be used but ai is not a replacement for um a teacher the teacher may use digital tools may not interact face to face but the brains behind that will continue to be a teacher that you, at least my view right professor rao uh, you have your own apprehensions for that uh, but uh, mr rahul do you have any different view than this no so i think i i partly uh, um, or rather more than partly agree with sir because i think people forget that technology is a tool and how you apply it is where 
your pedagogical framework comes in in terms of learning. Uh, just having something online uh, doesn't mean that you have effective learning. Uh, and similarly to what Sir said, uh, you know, I think uh, on the learning side and the retention side of learning, you need to apply technology appropriately. What I started by saying in the beginning, that you have the knowledge and the application and the behavioral part in a, and management science. Uh, what can technology solve in terms of uh, retention, we need to really debate uh, whether it's just the knowledge part of it or maybe the knowledge and a bit of application, but the behavioral part where, you know, how do you work with people who are different than you? I think that was said by uh, Professor Christopher. You know, that can't be taught just by having a platform online. Uh, you, even, even uh, you know, the best of uh, technology which used by HBS, you know, doesn't do that as effectively as it should. And there is a difference between that experience and physically meeting somebody. Uh, you know, when we spoke about internships before, sure, you know, people are doing projects remotely, but there is a difference between when you're doing a door-to-door -door selling as opposed to you're trying to create a strategy. You know, that experience in management science is absolutely necessary uh, in order for you to become a holistic manager. Also understand our education system in India is linear. So the youngster who comes into a postgraduate uh, environment is never worked before uh, or never done a proper job. So how does he uh, sort of understand the dynamics of an environment, interaction, engagement? So you need to have uh, uh, mechanisms of uh, teaching which ensure that happens. And that can only happen in a physical environment, not completely sure. on a virtual environment. So for overall development, it is required. So there are several many questions. I have a foundation of time. I cannot ask all the questions. Though all the questions will be emailed to you with their email IDs. If you are, would like to answer them, you can. Uh, Silky Ji, uh, there are questions for you. And especially people like to know about that app. So I will request you, if you uh, put the details of app in the chat or if you can email them. Uh, so if you can provide with me the uh, like email ID, uh, Karthik. Of course, I have written in the chat box also about the name of the app. But uh, if I get the uh, email IDs, I will even ask the IOGMENTOR team to connect with them directly if that is possible. Because that will also give them a demo also. And uh, just to add on, uh, in uh, like uh, before talking about online, I think one major point which is missed in the entire discussion was that uh, is uh, online degrees are going to be uh, replacing the offline degrees. Yes. We should not uh, just not talk about this uh, ending. So Let's I have your views on that because this is a point of uh, the foundation of time. But I think it's an important point, and if we have your view on that. Uh, that will be great. Yes, so basically, see, of course, I, I support here uh, this partially, like I was hearing with all the panelists, even though we are ready for the change, but we should not lose our focus on the core values of the education. Every course can't be converted into online. So maybe your MBA, like you're saying, like Sir has also converted his case study, these finding results, but of course, like a BTEC or an agriculture, I really don't think, of course, we are trying to cover the syllabus through online learning, but what about the practical knowledge, which why we had entered into a BTEC program or for that, for, for that matter, in medical. So I will only fully support this uh, online degree uh, when virtual reality or an, uh, or an augmented reality is, uh, is commercialized and uh, we are free to use it and the faculties and students can take the uh, leverage out of it. So uh, I will leave this with a question that how does an online degree substitute with all the things? I think we really need to understand, like I said before, the psychology of the students which they are going through right now. I think we as leaders need to keep the spirit of the traditional degree also live with them rather than misleading them that online degree is also okay. And our idea should be to inspire them. Of course, uh, we are ready for the change. We have converted ourselves onto a digital platform and now it's a time for blended learning. Of course, we should not leave this once the lockdown is getting over being optimistic. I think education uh, is, uh, is a very uh, biggest uh, area and innovation plays a very important role in our education industry also. So I think of uh, understanding and keeping the same pitch like what Akhil uh, sir said, I think let's be optimistic 
and take this time as a challenging time and let's come out with something which can benefit our students and the education fraternity after this lockdown and definitely you can mail me uh, the email ids i will surely give you the link of the app it is i augmentor app it can be uh, downloaded from the app store and the play store both and uh, they are also uh, uh, like working for various uh, various corporates also so i think we will have to get in touch with the the i augmentor team directly so that they can share with us the academic platform which sure, they have sure, sure. thank you silky yeah. professor Just, christopher yeah, yeah one thought on this uh, you know online because today it's becoming an imperative uh, there are mu not much of choices especially when there's a shutdown uh, so i think one of the things that accrediting bodies are looking into so i am coming from our own experience recently we have got approval for a couple of our courses to be run completely online and that's equivalent to an offline degree so if you're talking about a, a bachelor's in business administration or a master's in business administration online offline uh, they are equal to the same but here's the most important thing how do we assess them okay so are we giving them a piece of paper a certificate that validates he or she has done this program or are we testing the applications of the knowledge that they have acquired so i think the accrediting body is extremely clear about what you assess and how you assess mm -hmm. and if we could do that right and demonstrate yep this is what i learned in this particular program Uh, you know whatever it is it's agriculture engineering or management or whatever and this is how i'm going to apply it i think that becomes very very interesting right. you know i want to end this on a very uh, humorous note a few years back there was a lot of fanfare in a hotel in japan which was replaced which replaced all the human beings with robots some of you may be yes. familiar with the story yes there was a very interesting follow up story last year where there were serious complaints on the robots which got replaced by human beings so i think the answer between the teacher and ai which the professor rao beautifully put that ai is not a panacea the human system and uh, you know uh, professor bai spoke about the social uh, you know aspects of uh, human beings we still need the professor maybe the role of a teacher and professor may not be as a teacher it will be as a mentor a coach a facilitator a guide but not necessarily and i don't think any time technology can replace human beings yeah as they say guru gobind my question as they say guru gobind dono khade ka ke lagu paaye sahi hai bhai har ek guru aapne gobind ji bataye dr sani your uh, final remarks well i think uh, uh, one thing we probably uh, don't should be uh, maybe not realizing that social distancing is not going to go away uh, very quickly until maybe the vaccine is found in let's say 18 to 24 months that means that even after lockdown is over we can't fit in we can't cram in 30 40 students in a classroom right that means that you're going to have to have social distance i mean not more than let's say 10 15 people now obviously you have a fixed infrastructure you can't say if you are actually only accommodate half the students that you could accommodate earlier what are you going to do so this is actually a way for us to start post lockdown to start looking at flip classroom models where the older model was basically where a student would come into class the first time they heard of any information was through a lecture they spent a few hours in lectures then went home did some uh, homework and that was it the flip classroom model said that the student actually spends all their time at home learning the online content the theoretical content then comes to classroom has a group discussion has a project has an interactive learning around it that means that uh, time is not wasted just giving gyan lectures right. and as i said that by powerpoint the key thing is is that when you look at universities in the uk which we have partnered with they define teaching hours as not the amount of time the student is in the class only 30% of teaching time is in the class most of the time is actually out doing projects out doing stuff out in the field so i would strongly suggest that every institution not just a business school but even uh, colleges and other ones who actually are more innovative start looking at uh, having project based learning flip classroom where the most of the work is done outside the classroom and the classroom interaction happens with smaller back right. uh, smaller batches and very more back and that actually would have or of uh, address some of the issues about how we get the right. human interaction happening in class but i think sure. assume social distancing is going to be a reality for us for the next uh, at least two academic years let's okay. start flipping our classrooms to make sure that we adapt to it thanks dr sani professor bhaskar can we close it with your remarks please all right uh, as uh, professor abram was talking about and professor rao also touched upon whether it will be replaced the online education be replacing the actual education the fact remains online education can be used only for the transfer of knowledge 
But if you look at what Professor Abram started with that uh, six intelligences, a good manager under the crisis environment need to have, or any manager need to have these six to eight skills, they're all behavioral skills. They're not actually knowledge that I understand how to operate a machine or how to open a machine or how to design engine. It's all attitude. That I don't think online education can transfer, nor really teacher transfers it directly. It transfers in the dynamics of a campus, dynamics of a classroom and dynamics of the environment where classroom is a facilitation a laboratory. And that in, under that laboratory, actually the student is groomed. So the fact remains that uh, that part of the education can never be imparted. Because ultimately, what we are grooming them is not for the knowledge. For the online traditional manager, if they want to acquire a skill, I am a good in whatever supply chain management, but I'm not so equipped with some financial, whatever analysis, I can go online and learn and acquire that knowledge and get that knowledge for me. But what we want to grow in people is the wisdom. Wisdom cannot be transferred. Only knowledge can be transferred. And what we, want, what we are creating, especially in the management schools, and so at every, every level, people with better wisdom or evolved wisdom. And that has always happened in humanity, and that's how humanity has evolved from people to people or amongst a group of people that knowledge and wisdom has appeared. And uh, technology can be facilitator, accelerator in many of those factors, but the real grooming of the human being will be done by other human beings as a colleagues, peers, or mentors. That's all. Thank you, Professor Baskar. I think uh, there's a lot to discuss, but we don't have much time with us now. And uh, thank you, everybody. And I would, uh, I think I, uh, th we can summarize that this period has challenges and opportunities, but we have scope of innovations and experimenting. So I'll uh, close it with uh, two lines uh, in Hindi, which is, and with that, let's <laughs> close this wonderful session. And thank you, everybody. Namaste. And it was uh, wonderful to have all of you here. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you